Why don't you just put your hands together and thank the band and singers. Now, I've mentioned this before, but, you know, it's so easy to come into a church and uh, see the place tidy, cleaned up. I think Sue does that. And uh, to find that uh, all the communion and stuff's all ready. Right? Thanks, Pam. And then we think that the, the streaming and everything is happening to Gary and... Uh, and uh, and his team, and then we look at the music with Jasoni and his team, and then we look at the preparation of the uh, e-bulletin and the material that's there, and Ning has been preparing that. Now, a church doesn't happen just because uh, we turn up to church. A whole lot of things happen and people put things together and, and serve faithfully week by week, and we want to appreciate that as much as we can. So in terms of thanking people, see, some people sort of say, oh, that's, that's giving glory to man. No, it's not. It's giving glory to God in how he's operated in people's lives that they might be a blessing to others. And that's what it's all about. So thank you, team, for all of the work that you put in. And uh, you can always pick up the note outline. If, you, well, you've, if you've all got a copy of the note outline, should, most people should have something there. Anyone not? That's good. All right, we're going to be into the prayer of Jabez. 1 Chronicles 4, 9 and 10. Living large for God is the first part. You know, some people live lives of quiet desperation and regret. They, they often feel they're going nowhere. And, and often they think that they're not the right person. You ever, you ever felt that you're not really up to the standard, up to the mark? I know as a pastor... Uh, so often, and it doesn't matter how long you've been in ministry. I mean, I've been in ministry, what, 40 plus years. And as a professional counsellor for so many years, the same amount of time. And, and there are always new challenges. And it's not so much that you can't stand up and speak and do stuff. I mean, that's, that's what you've got used to doing. But the issue is when situations arise and so on, you think, oh, I don't think I'm the right person for this the problems are too difficult, whatever. And so often we think we're not the right person to influence people. Or we haven't got the right affluence to, to pay for things. Not the right intelligence. Not the right appearance. You know, sometimes you look in the mirror and say, God, how come you've done this to me? The fact of the matter is we always think that we're deficient in some sort of sense. I'm not at the right location. You know... Life hasn't smiled on me the right way. And such thinking leads to all kinds of quick and easy placebos. In other words, something we take to try and solve that feeling of not being quite equal to what's going on or what's needed. You know, I was reading in a magazine an article that, uh, that was entitled The Cost of a New You. You know, we often want to be a different person than we are. And this is what this article said. You can turn yourself, and this was for women. I mean, for men, it'll be a different set of figures. But for women, uh, you can be the woman that you've always dreamed of, thanks to the miracle of plastic surgery. Then they list the cost of various items covered. You can get an eyebrow lift for $2,350, upper eyelids for whatever, for, for uh, uh, $2,050. You can get bags under the eyes fixed up for 2050 as well. A nose job, 2250 a facelift, chin reduction, goes on and gives all the prices. In other words, it says at the end, you can be a new you if you have this plastic surgery at the cost of $36,640. And it concluded the article by saying, and then no one will recognise you, not even God. You know, some people just want to be different. They don't, they're not satisfied with who they are. But it's good at the start of a new year to take time to evaluate our lives and our ministry, particularly as we commence in a year we don't really understand and know what it's going to be. And, and this year is going to present some really good things, some bad things, even some ugly things. And, and we need to accept that as part of life. 
Zechariah was saying, look, as Christians, we can be separate, if you like, with that sixth sense of the word of God giving us understanding. We can be separate from the pressures of the world to know that we will still have a God that's good to us and provides. You know, once we've done this bit of a a look at uh, what the last year's been like, and we, we talked about starting again, making a new start we talked about that last um, last service it's good to look forward as to how we're going to make a fresh start to begin to concentrate on the future to reaffirm things to commit to certain things and it is possible to become a new person spiritually emotionally relationally and even physically did you know that whilst No new atoms have been created and destroyed. In fact, we're all composed of atoms that have been here since the beginning of time. But uh, the cells in our body, over 98% of the cells in your body have been replaced. You might say, well, how come I've lost all the the good ones and only got the bad ones left? Because I look the same. But it is true. But but many people make the transition from one year to the next and they carry with them the regrets and the pain and the struggles. And as I've mentioned, uh, I've had a lot of counselling recently where people are still carrying with them all the rubbish from their childhood and it's still affecting them. And and their favourite phrase is, if only, if only I'd had this, if only this hadn't happened, if only... Someone has said the definition of dying is looking toward yesterday and the definition of living is looking towards tomorrow. We need to look forward. And as we evaluate our lives with all the possibilities, we need to do this in God's presence as believers because he's our creator, he's our provider, he's, he's the one that supports and, and preserves us and whatever. And we need to ask him serious questions. What is it that God has for me this coming year? What does God want to do in me, to me and through me this coming year? Good questions. You know, and, and in Jeremiah 29, 11 to 14, it says, this is Jeremiah speaking on behalf of God. He says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a, a hope and a future. And then you will call on me and come and pray to me. I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me for me with all your heart. And then declares the Lord, I'll be found by you and bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Now that's an Old Testament statement. And it's a statement about the Jews being in captivity and they disobeyed God, turned from him and God allowed them to be taken into exile. But then he promises them again, you can be delivered if you turn back to me. But there's a question that we need to ask even more. What do you want from God this year? If we had time, I'd go around and interview a few people and say, what is it that you want from God this year? You know, we're often afraid to ask this question for fear of sounding selfish and self-serving. But in the next few weeks, you'll understand that it is legitimate to ask your Heavenly Father what it is you want from Him. That we would have that confidence to come before God and express what it is that we want. Now, I've been in, in a faith ministry for many years and now I do whatever I can within my budget extend beyond that to to support causes and so on. And it's interesting, in our giving, we give about 20% of our money, which is not much when you compare with a pension and so on, but we give to whatever we can possibly give. And we're God's known person's debtor. As you give to God, he gives to you. But Jabez is an interesting character, and we've seen the passage of Scripture, and we've sung that song. It's a great prayer, isn't it? A great prayer song. Just imagine if you woke up every morning and you were singing that prayer out. But Jabez, uh, uh, in 1 Chronicle 4.10, there's a prayer. Jabez cried out to God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And I love the conclusion, which will come in the third message. 
and God granted his request. This wasn't just a prayer that was on deaf ears and you're sort of, God's pretty old and maybe he needs another hearing aid. But the reality is, God answered, granted his request. So the prayer is a simple little prayer of four parts. We're going to cover it in three. We'll do two parts in one. But that can be remembered from the mnemonic B-E-S-T. Jabez's prayer is the best prayer that you can pray. B, bless me. Oh, that you would bless me, God. E, expand my ministry, enlarge my territory. S, stay with me. Let your hand be with me. And T, take away evil. Keep me from harm. What a great prayer. And this prayer of Jabez can literally transform our lives. If we were to seriously and sincerely pray this prayer, we too could be confident that God would grant our request. Now Jabez, he's a face that stands out in the crowd. When you read through the, the Bible, you'll find profound stories. There's all sorts of great characters in the Bible that we know about. You could go to uh, Samson and David and, and, and Joshua and, and, and Caleb and all these people. But it's funny, in the scriptures, it seems to be that God suddenly pulls out the name of someone, gives them a few verses to instruct us, and then that's all we hear about them. Well, so it is with Jabez. You know, you go through the... I, I remember a sermon that was uh, preached by, uh, uh, by a, a great American preacher. And he actually preached on the, the um, genealogy in, in Genesis. And you're thinking, I don't know where you, you get your Bible out and you tell someone, start reading from the beginning of the Bible and you read a couple, of, and then you get to genealogies. There's all these names and you say, how boring is that? And you give up. But this guy preached on that. And what he actually did, he preached on all the names in order and gave their literal meaning as names. And he put it all together. And you know, in the genealogy in Genesis chapter 5 is the whole gospel message. Just with names. And we never even thought it was there. Great exercise if you go through that. It's an awesome, I'll preach it here someday because I've taken a record of all that and it blew me away when I first saw it because I thought, yeah, I've been to the genealogies too and they're as boring as. But you know, in this, in chapter 4, we, we, Jabez's name suddenly arises out of nowhere. Something about him caused the chronicler, it's in the book of Chronicles, the writer, to actually mention his name. And we don't get much more information than what's in those couple of verses. We only have a, a brief account of who he was. Jabez was remembered for what he did, and not for what he did, I'm sorry, but he was mentioned because of the prayer he prayed. So it says in there, in verses 9 and 10, Jabez was more honourable than his brothers. His mother had named him Jabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. And Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me. Keep me from harm so that I'll be free from pain. And God granted his request. So in verse 9 which is preceding verse 10, we have a little bit of a description of who Jabez was. He was a man beset with issues. Here's the things that come out of that, and you might say, well, it's just projection, but we don't get any more information. But a lot of scholars have looked through this and have given this as an understanding. One, he had dishonourable brothers. It says he was more honourable than his brothers. The first clue comes from this phrase, Jacob, uh, Jabez was more honourable than his brothers. This says something more about his brothers than it does about Jabez. We read that he was more honourable than indicates that they were probably dishonourable. And, and it could be that his family had a bad reputation because of them. Jabez is regarded as the exception to his family. He has strong character in contrast to his brothers. Secondly, he was a pain to his mother. We know that in childbirth, every child is a pain to the mother, but this seems to go a little bit further than that. The mother named him Jabez, 
which means pain or sorrow. Literally, he was a pain to his mother. And th this is interesting, when you look at it, it could be referring to the pain of childbirth, but it could be the pain that this woman experienced with her children, and Jabez was one of them. Only God knows for sure what caused the ache and the anguish of the mother. Then he had a bleak future. that The Bible often uses names to reflect something of the character and destiny. Solomon means peace. He, he was the first king of Israel to reign without going to war. Jabez, on the, hand, on the other hand, was a, a child of sorrow marked as a loser. He caused pain from his first breath. And, and in his mother's mind, what came out of her, she may have even seen as worthless after the other brothers had been come and gone. The label is one of shame, insignificance. It stuck with him. He was known as Jabez, pain, sorrow. And then he had no father present. If we look a little closer, we'll notice some omissions in this verse. The mother, the brothers are talked about, the father's not talked about. And it could well be that he wasn't even there. He may have passed away. He might have walked out on the family. Who knows? There's no mention of a father figure for him. He lived in poverty. Because his prayer was, and many people at that day were in poverty, but he wanted God to enlarge his territory. Which is another way of saying, increase my material possessions. God, I need to be better off than I am. And, and it may have been that he had no future, no inheritance. There was probably nothing in the family. And this may tell us something significant about Jabez. We have to use our imagination, but the family may have had no money. He may have had no future possibilities of an inheritance. His father could have been irresponsible, could have been shamed, disgraced. You don't know, but you could project all sorts of things. And then finally... It was painfully obvious he was dissatisfied with his life situation. He prays, keep me from harm so that I'll be free from pain. There's a play on words here. Harm or pain translates back into the name Jabez. Keep me from jabez me. Keep me from causing pain in me. Keep me from causing sorrow. I don't have anything to give. I need a better situation. And when we look at this particular man, Jabez, it seems as if he's got all the cards stacked against him. But you see, one of the interesting things for us, no matter what your situation, you add up all the things about Jabez and he comes confidently before God or maybe pleading before God, God, I need your blessing. I cannot survive in this world without your blessing. And so if you've got an excuse in your life that says, well, you know, I've got a dishonorable family. My mother thought I was a pain. I didn't have much of a future. I had no father present. I'm living in poverty. I need something to take me out of this terrible situation. If you feel that way, this prayer's for you. It covers all of us. Because the issue here is Jabez had everything to complain about. He comes before God and pleads his case before God and says, God, bless me. Oh, that you would bless me. And sometimes we can feel a bit like Jabez. And we can look at ourselves and we can start a pity party and we can talk about all sorts of things we haven't got. As I mentioned once before to you when I was at Melbourne University years ago and a Jewish psychiatrist came and spoke and he was, he, he was amazing with his wisdom but he was also a very funny man. He was like having a comic who had great wisdom. And he, he left this little, little statement, a little ditty he says, as you travel on through life, let one thing be your goal. Keep your eye upon the donut and not upon the hole. How true. Look at what we have, what we could have rather than what we haven't got. And so uh, there's some good news. No matter how bad our past has been, our future is always bright with Christ. Great, de great uh, devotional time around communion today. You didn't know what I was going to be speaking about, but the reality is 
you are saying exactly the same thing. When we are in Christ, we can set aside the world out there, come before God and say, God, in you are all things. That's our, our legacy. And so we know that as believers, when we come and seek our loving Father in heaven, we know that we need the power of God to be unleashed in our life and he is the one to unleash it if we come before him. You know, it's interesting in, in uh, psychology, there's a pain and pleasure principle of change. People only change when the pain of staying where they are exceeds the pain of change. You think about it. Even in a church. Oh, we've always done it this way and until the pain of staying where you are exceeds the pain, is, is uh, exceeded by the pleasure of going to something better, we'll stay where we are. Or the pleasure of what we currently experience, if it exceeds the pleasure of what might come, we stay where we are. And the pain and pleasure principle applies to most people's lives. And so in the middle of Jabez's statement before God, I suppose he was still operating on that pleasure pain principle, but I think he was starting to realise that the pleasure of what is promised in God exceeds the pain of what I'm experiencing now. And, and, and I want to move forward. In Psalm 90 verse 15, Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us for as many years as we have seen trouble, said the psalmist. In other words, I've been through all this affliction, but I want that you would bless me more than all of that stuff that's gone before and has limited my life. So how do we account for the change in life? The answer is found in a new paradigm for prayer. If we really want to be truly a different person for this year, then we will need to take up the challenge of this prayer. No matter how you pray it, it will have to be a consuming prayer for you. Bruce Wilkinson, who wrote the initial book on, on, uh, on Jabez, uh, the prayer of Jabez, he says, God really does have unclaimed blessings waiting for you. Think of it this way. Instead of standing near the river's edge and asking for a cup of water to get you through each day, do something unthinkable. You will take the little prayer with the giant prize and jump into the river. Don't just take a cup from the river, jump into its flow. Jump into a life with God. And he goes on to say, you will take the little prayer, the giant prize, jump into the river, and at that moment, you will begin to let the loving currents of God's grace and power carry you along. God's great plan for you will surround you and will sweep you forward into the profoundly important and satisfying that God has waiting for you. I don't know if you've ever been to uh, Bullcock Beach or down Caloundra Way. You know, where the, the current comes through, there's the sand there, and when the tide's flowing, one of the great things is just to dive off the edge and be taken by the current out to where the, the waves break. It's the same at Majimba, if you go down to the, the point on, at Majimba there. Same thing, to, to jump into the current and feel the power of the current taking you along. It's a great experience. Do it if you haven't got nothing else to do over the holidays. But, you know, verse 10 begins with a phrase, Jabed cries out to God of Israel. Let the burden of his shame cause Jabez to cry out to God. He didn't just whisper his request, he yelled them out. I remember years ago when we at, um, uh, with Kenmore Baptist Church when we'd gone through years and we spent over a million and a half, nearly two million dollars on trying to get new land build premises, we just met obstacle after obstacle. And I remember I'd gone away for some, uh, some a lengthy sort of pause break in ministry. I was on the beach up at 1770. We got the news that we'd lost our court case against the, the council's denial of our right to build. And uh, I remember talking to God... <laughs> You know, it wouldn't be a conversation that you'd want me to repeat. But the fact is, I was in a very loud vocal argument with God. I say, God, look, we've worked for 15 years on this. You own the cattle on a thousand hills. Our people have 
empty their pockets to move forward. And yet we meet with this obstacle again. Fourth time we tried and, and, and failed to move forward. All wasted energy. And I'm saying, God, release, release the land for us. Release something that we can actually move ahead. We've got no real place to go. Well, he did that in the next number of years. Provided it all. And you're welcome to come out of the prayer meeting and have a look at the facility. It's an amazing facility. But it wasn't the facility, it's God's blessing. When you jump into the river and say, God, you are my only hope. You are our only hope. In you we place our trust. Now God bless us. Bless us. And so this is the start of Jabed's prayer. Right? And in Psalm 22, 24, it's interesting, you'll find in there when uh, the psalmist urges us, for he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. And you can imagine the psalmist is saying, well, when you're desperate, cry out to God. Don't, don't whimper to him, cry out to God. He's not offended by that. Again, Zacharias down here and he's leading communion. And he did that last time and I'm thinking, man, he just wants to see if there's the living amongst the dead here. He wants people to rise up and say something. Declare to God that he is God and that you trust him. And this is the element of the prayer. And you know, it's interesting when Jesus was uh, to be crucified, same thing happened. He's crying out to God, he's He's sweating drops of blood, as it were. He's, he's in agony. God, I want to do your will. Take this cup from me if it's your will. But if not, I'm for you. I'm going your way. It's awesome. There's a couple of warnings associated with the prayer of Jabez, however. Prayer is not an incantation, incantation or a magic formula. Just because the prayer of Jabez has that statement by you repeating it over and over again is not going to change things because it really depends on where your heart is before God. God sees your heart, doesn't listen so much to your words. He already knows what those words mean by looking at your heart. And you look at this in Matthew 6, 7 and 8, it says, And when you're praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. You know, it's not like the Jewish phylactery. You know, if the more I spin this thing, the more God's going to answer. That's rubbish. He, he heard you the first time. But he looks at your heart. And it says in this passage here, the Gentiles suppose they'll be heard for their many words. So don't be like them, for your father knows what you want before you even ask. You know, in the, in the passage in Scripture, you know, ask and seek and, and you shall find, they're all in the aorist tense, you know, oh, sorry, the progressive continuous tense, which basically ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking. That we've got to do, we've basically press into God, he is our only hope. Secondly, God doesn't always grant what we request within the time frame. I've experienced that, you know, I look back at, say, River Life when we, or at, at Kenmore Baptist Church. Started off with a group of 180 people and, you know, it was basically a split church and a whole lot of things happening. And you looked at that and I thought, gee, in five years we could see over a thousand people coming. That's what I lived in. That's what I believed in. We started to see that and, and we're going to get new facilities. Well, 25 years later, God provides. But he's provided something more than we'd ever dared to ask or dream of. But nonetheless, we walked around land, we... <laughs> Buried our promises in the ground. We did all sorts of stuff. The fact is, God's timetable is not always the same as ours. And we need to face that. And it's interesting in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 and 9, where Paul suffered the thorn in the flesh. And he says in the, in the scripture, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations. In other words, he had an experience of God that others didn't have, but he ended up with a thorn in the flesh. People projected what that might have been. However, he said, God didn't just take away the problem, otherwise I'd become conceited. I had these great revelations and when I pray to my God, he gives me everything I want. That's not the way it is. God keeps building us as people. 
And, and then he goes on, he says, of the thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take away from me this thorn in the flesh. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my prayer, power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, says Paul, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power rests on me. Wow, what a passage. So sometimes God doesn't grant what we request. Our prayers should ask God to help us to do what he is blessing, not bless what we're doing. And this is the secret of the whole thing, that it has got to be God's will. His blessing comes when we align with his will. So prayer is not so much even asking God. Prayer is being open and available for God to do in us what he wants, to impress upon us what he wants. And then when we're convinced that we will go his way, then we can pray the prayer of Jabez. You follow the sequence. It's not just a, an incantation we can call on and expect God to do A, B, C, D. The fact is God's got to change us first and when we align with him, we have openness to the Father. Think what a difference our prayers could make if we prayed this way. If we're praying with the attitude that God's will be done, the prayer will ultimately benefit us and will benefit all of the people that we connect with. So part one of Jabez's prayer, bless me, O, oh, that you would bless me. The word O oh, in the front there is just like a punctuation mark. It's an accent. It basically is, oh, God, bless me. It's an exclamation of his urgency, his, his, his intensity before God. And, and as we look at this, there's a desperation of, of this request. He was utterly fed up with his lot and knew that his path ahead was submission to God's call in his life, which would secure for him a future and a hope. And that's the reality of this prayer. So the, the meaning of Jabez's request you know, so often in prayers, when we can't think of anything else, we just say, bless, bless us, God, bless you, bless this, and we go through all this blessing stuff. You've got to realize that this word bless has a deep meaning. You know, it's, when we go talk about the, the, the word barak, means to kneel. It's used 330 times in Scripture, all the way through Genesis in the Psalms and Ezekiel. But this idea of blessing was not just provide something, it was open the floodgates of heaven and pour out what we need to do your work, God. Pour on us everything that's required to align us with your purposes because we know when we align with you, you will do everything that's required in our lives. Well... This is a big prayer. <laughs> this is not just bless me this and give me that like we're talking to Father Christmas. Excuse anyone with white beards or white hair. It's not just talking to Father. It's talking to the living God who owns and possesses and controls all things. And this is where we've got to be. There's a reality of Jabez's request. To ask God to bless us is to ask him to reveal himself in a way that we have never experienced, to draw us close to him, that his gifts of goodness would fall on us for the advancement of his kingdom. Do you want to live in that sort of world? That's really what we should be longing for. You know? To put it another way, when Jabez asked God to bless him, he's saying, Lord, first of all, above everything else, let me embrace you as my God until I know and believe and are strengthened that I belong to you. And in belonging to you, you are the one that will control my future, will provide all that I need as I live for you. Wilkinson put it this way, to bless in the biblical sense means to ask for or to impart spiritual favour. When we ask for God's favour, we're crying out for the wonderful, unlimited goodness that only God has the power to know about or to give us. But the, the difficulty here is that in James 4, 2, it says you have not because you don't ask. Wilkinson argues that even though there is no limit to God's goodness, if you don't ask him for a blessing yesterday, 
you didn't get all that you were supposed to, supposed to have. If you don't plead with God for his blessing and apply it to your life, the probability is you're heading through life in a limited sense, not experience what he has for us. You know, one of the, one of the greatest... Uh, and disappointments when we get to heaven will be to find that there's so many gifts up there waiting for us that we never ever asked for but could have. Mm. You see, in, a, in, in John 1 16, it says, From the fullness of his grace, we have re all received one blessing after another. Ephesians 1 3 says, We're blessed in the heavenly realms with every blessing in Christ. That's the truth. And when we look at that, we've got to say, well, how are we going in terms of what God is doing in our lives? A lot of cases we, we, we can say, yeah, I believe in God, all this. But in, underneath we're actually saying, gee, there's miserable return for all of this. And probably because we're not connecting in with God and wanting the blessing in what it really means. Because going a little bit further, Jesus said these things in, in Matthew 7. He says, Which of you, if his son asked for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, will give him a snake? If you, though, being, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Hmm. Wesley uh, says from his sermon on prayer, the purpose of your praying is not to inform God as though he didn't already know what you wanted. No, it is to inform yourself, to fix your wants more clearly in your heart and to remind yourself of your continual dependence on God who is always more willing to give than you are to ask. Then you will be more willing to receive the good things he has prepared for you. Mm. well what's operative the operative phrase here Jesus said to those who ask him he gives you know 1 Timothy 6 17 it says command those who are rich in the present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth which is so uncertain but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment so there's some misconceptions that are about in, in, associated with Jabez's request. And one of the problems is that God is responsible for everything, not me. Well, I want to say to you, it's a partnership. You know, for example, if you're a, a loving parent, there are times when you'll just give freely to your kids, but if there's a, if there's a dysfunctional relationship and you don't ask your father or don't connect with your father or don't ab abide in him, then the fact is you don't get too much. So there's universal grace. God gives to even the sinner, to even the person who hates him, whatever. God even gives to the atheists, to the, to the unbelievers, whatever. But the fact is he gives so much more to those who are in him. Even more to those who are aligned with his purposes, who live for him. Second misconception, if I'm doing God's will, I won't be afraid. You know, we, we, we pretend a lot of things in Christianity. You, know, you say, oh, in God, I never fear. We, we all have fears. When situations are beyond us, when we don't have the resources, we don't have the margins in our life, so often we're fearful of even committing to God even more. If I go to people and say, hey, listen, God's call on your life is to do this, you say, look, I can't do it. I'm so busy, got no margins. I mean, I've got so many hours of television I watch, I've got so many other things, and I've got to go to work. And, I've got... and by the time you align it all, there's no space for God. But the fact is, when we say we're going to be committed to God, it costs us something. And, and if we don't have any fear, there's a sense in which we probably haven't really considered the cost involved. I said to you once before, you know, well, in fact, I said to the leadership team who asked me at one stage, how will we know when your time here is finished? Oh, good question. I said, well, I'll give you a simple answer, but I'm not sure whether you're ready for it. I'm no longer needed here when your passion for God is so great and for this church so great that you're willing to die for it. 
I'm not needed then. See, the issue is, it, it's not much good to say, hey, we love this church, we want to see it grow, but I'm sorry, I'm not going to be involved. And it's not going to cost me anything. And I'll just come for whatever blessing I can get and then I'll disappear. The fact is, you'll never build anything that way. God wants to work in partnership and it requires us to commit to him, him to give, us to enjoy the blessings of what he provides, but then to be engaged in meaningful life that says, I am committed. It doesn't have to be here, it could be anywhere, but committed to what God, God's call on my life is and to the church that I say that I belong to. Okay, uh, there's many times where I've been absolutely afraid to commit further to God. I know when my wife said, well, okay, what's on for this year? I said, well, I feel that we need to continue on here to see the things happen that God has called us to do. And, and uh, the, the fact is, we stop, we consider the cost, and the good thing is, she said, well, you'll never be happy until you, you show the commitment and you see the outcomes you're looking for. That's why you took it on. There's truth contained in Jabez's prayer. One, Jabez believed in God's love and goodness towards him, enough to be bold and courageous in prayer and in all that he faced in life. God is not a fan of timidity of hyper-caution, of people who never commit, who don't want to get out of the bubble, who don't want to really move ahead or are afraid of making a mistake. You'll never see anything done if you're afraid of those sort of things. Secondly, God loves people who step out in faith, who take a risk, who take him up on his promises, who dream big and ask and attempt big things. I remember years ago talking to a, uh, a pastor up in the, uh, the, uh, the mountains outside of Melbourne. And uh, I went to a baptism of a friend of mine that I'd sort of led to faith and gone through university with. And he said, oh, come to my baptism. Well, I'll tell you what, the baptism was enough to scare the living daylights out of you because there was snow on all the hills there and the temperature was about freezing. And into this little hole in the river there, they all went for the baptism. I thought, man, that's a test of, of commitment. But I spoke to this pastor afterwards and I said, yeah, you've got a great little church here. I said, what's your vision? He said, do you see these fold mountains are there? He said, in every one of those fold mountains is a little village. There's no church there. My vision is that every one of those hills is far as to when the hills cease. That's my mission field. Whoa. And I've spoken to pastors who have got buildings, got all the facility, and their mission field doesn't extend any, anything beyond the walls of the church. See, when you think big, not because you want to be this person who thinks big, but when you think big because your God is big, when you think extravagantly because your God is extravagant, when you think beyond your resources that are limited because your God has all the resources, that's when God starts to do something. Isn't that true? At the beginning of a year... This church is going nowhere unless people start to think big, get out of their own way, start to step out in faith, willing to trust God, willing to invest their lives into something. It doesn't happen unless that happens. It's a partnership. The question to ask is, what fear is stopping me today from really asking God to bless me as Jabez did? What misconception about prayer is giving that fear power over me next time I face fear about Christian commitment about what I need to do how I should be involved what should I do and the sorts of prayers we should be praying in this coming year and praise God Sue's taken charge there woman of faith and uh, she will lead us in terms of calling on an extravagant God to bless us and we'll, we'll join with you we want to see God do some great things. You know, in this coming year, we're to start asking God, first of all, to transform our lives. Make us bigger spiritually than we've ever been before. Make us more enthusiastic for, for God's work than we ever have been before. Give us a boldness to step out further than we've ever stepped out before. We should be asking that God... 
would rescue people from the domain of darkness. We are surrounded by people that don't know him. What are we going to do about it? We need greater faith. We need to repent from the way we're going, confess that, move back towards what God wants. There should be reconciliation amongst people. Any people who want to divide a fellowship, that's not where it's at. We should be asking that God would do great and wonderful things in our church this year so that we have no choice but to bow down and worship him. The question is, will you join us in, in asking that God bless us indeed? Do whatever's required for us to, to actually receive the blessing of God. And, and whether you're old or not, it doesn't make any difference. I love the Joshua and Caleb story when they got into the promised land and they were dividing up territory and you would have thought that they would have given to Caleb, the old man of the tribe there, given him the, the flat land and the easy land. But he said, no, I'll take the hill country where there are giants and everything else. Give me that country because, my God, he can handle it. I don't have to handle it. He'll handle it. So what does he do? He goes and makes an impact where some of the younger men who hadn't had that experience of life opted for the easy path. We can turn the thing up on its head. If, you, if you're an older person and you can't literally physically do the minute, you can pray. You can call in the blessing of God like you've never done before. Now, it's interesting, I, I was looking about a, a, an illustration, Roger Bannister in 1954. Remember, he was the first person to break the, the, the four-minute mile, as it were. And uh, there's a whole lot of stuff that happened. There were others who were getting close to that, and he was in a race. And uh, he, was, he was there to break that four-minute mile. And uh, something happened in the middle of the race, and he looked backwards. Ended up losing the race when he should have won it. The fact is, if we look backwards, we want to go back to where things were. That's not going to work for anybody. We're going to look backwards and not forwards. As I said before, you can't drive forwards looking in the, in the rear vision mirror. I think some people do, but they end up having a bad accident. We need to stop and pause at the beginning of this new year to reflect and say, what do we want this year to become? God, now, what is it that I want you to do for me? God, what is it that I want you to do for this church? What is it that I want you to do for my family, for my neighbours, for whatever, so that I align with your purposes? I'm going to be heading in your direction. And that's a massive challenge. And over this year, I'm trusting that we can mobilise a lot of people, not because they're conscripts, but because they're jumping out of their skin to say, well, I offer this. I'll get involved here. God has led me here. We're open to whatever. Just tell us what God's, going, what, what, what God's saying to you and tell us what you expect God to do. I'm looking forward to seeing God perform a miracle in this place. Are you? But starting with a miracle in your own life. No complacency, no negativity, no fear, only faith. Move forward to see what God can really do. So the summary of this first message, calling out for an appropriate God's blessing involves first of all appreciation that God is the unlimited and never-ending source of every good thing and he wants to impart his good things to us as our loving Heavenly Father. It begins with appreciation. Next, submission in faith to God's will and God's ways despite the challenges, the uncomfortableness this may represent. So appreciation, submission in faith to God's will and acceptance that God alone should determine what is good for us and the time frame within which he will deliver his blessing. So to seriously ask God to bless us is both an exciting and potentially dangerous prayer that could well be life-changing. And I say to you and I make a commitment to you that over this year I will be working as much as I am able trusting in God to see this fellowship grow, people released, people to really serve, to be involved, to celebrate in God's goodness. Wouldn't it be an awesome year if that were to happen? Hmm? I'm believing it will. And just by the very fact that a number of people come back and all those people that are sitting at home watching a stream service, 
There's plenty of seats in here for you to come. We enjoy fellowship together. We trust God. We share stories. We find out what God is doing in our lives and we celebrate. And I would love to see this church not return to its former glory, but return or go forward, I should say, to the, the glory that God has for it in the future, this new normal, whatever it is. Let's pray. God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for this prayer of Jabez. Only a, a couple of verses. It tells us so much. But in looking at this first part, God, that you would bless us in the true meaning of the word, that you would challenge us, you would open us up, you would change us, and you would align us with your purposes, and then you would provide what necessary for us to fulfill them. And so, Father, we commit ourselves to you this day, for this year, and we, we don't just sit back, but we assume responsibility, co-workers with you, to see what you will produce. And we thank you for your many blessings of the past, your blessings at present, and in faith, the blessings that we'll receive in the future. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you. Last song. Thank you, Rick, for bringing us match this morning. I would like to, uh, to ask you one thing. If you could all stand, and we'll sing that song again.